So you're thinking about running, but not sure how to take the first step. My name's Brian Patterson, and I'm here to help. And welcome to Brian's Rompod. Welcome back to Brian's Rompod. In this second instalment of interviewing Aaron Nicholson, we explore the profound impact that minor adjustments in your running technique can have in your performance and delve into the vital role of strength training for runners. We also investigate the intricate relationship between genetics, your footwear and running style. Plus, we'll weigh the pros and cons of modern technology in your training regime. It's all about finding the perfect balance and listening to your body for peak performance. So whether you're a seasoned marathoner or just getting started in your running journey, this episode promised to deliver a wealth of knowledge and advice so you can elevate your running experience. Lace up your running shoes and join us as we navigate the intriguing and empowering world of running. Let's hit the ground running. We start our discussion about one of the trends in footwear over the past years and was it what it was all cracked up to be? I really hope you enjoy our discussion. Barefoot running is the way forward. So let's <laughs> take off our nice, yeah. thick, cushioned, yeah. sold, in, insole and yeah. trainers yeah. Yeah. and let's stick on a pair of five fingers and go out and run. And then we go, actually, there's, there's no transition in terms of the technique change that needs to happen yeah. for, for one to get on with those types of shoes. And so then... yeah they were seen as the devil because it yeah. was blowing everyone's Achilles and everyone was getting stress fractures in their feet because they had But then it, was it was it based on a tribe or is it a South American tribe or something like that? Yeah, but they've been doing yeah. that for years and years and it's exactly. kind of ingrained in their DNA or something. It's something that may be... Something. Yeah, even the DNA point is an interesting one because our, our kind of, our, to a certain extent, our, our genetics do have... A part, to play, a part yeah. to play, but not yeah. as big a part as you would think. I think the the main point, as you as you say there, is that actually they've always done it. Yeah. Our bodies are incredibly adaptable and are absolutely unbelievably good at conditioning themselves to the stresses that we put on it. And so, actually, if we've done that from ten months, eleven months, twelve months old, mm. and I've never worn a pair of shoes then actually I'm not going to have a problem running barefoot right. when I'm 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay. Yeah. It's those extremes and, and the load management again of if yeah. I am used to wearing a trainer and then I take that away, yeah. I need to give my body yeah. ample adaptation time to get used to this mm. change in, in environment and this change in stress and this change mm. in, in scenario. And that's typically where things go wrong is that we don't give ourselves potentially enough time to to adapt okay. it's it's on the, on the kind of footwear side of things obviously there's a lot made of these super shoes with obviously yeah the berlin marathon last week and yes the women's world record yeah. dropping by two minutes yeah. and yeah. everyone going because i was listening to the runners world podcast and mm. they were saying that this kind of filters down does this mean that with these uh particular shoes that it is making in running too expensive. Mm. You're getting some manufacturers, and I think it's Adidas, who mm. are in the, these really expensive shoes, which will only last 50 miles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. And they're like super light or something yeah. like that. So, so where it's always useful you know, to have a sponsorship. Yeah, so, yeah. exactly. <laughs> when that kind of made, that's, that's maybe another argument. That, mm. you know, so I, think, that, I think it's one of those ones where uh, the letters, Along the same lines as the VO2 max testing and the, and the lactate testing and that side of yeah. things is that when you are elite, it will make a difference. It's right. simple as that. And right. that is, and, and certainly that's without taking anything away yeah. from the athlete. Yeah. Because actually all you are doing is you are taking an unbelievably well-trained, tra- ridiculously fast mm. athlete mm. and giving them the best possible chance of being even faster. Mm. What I would argue is that if you are a club runner, if you are a 
weekend runner, if yeah. you are a once or twice a week runner, then yeah. the benefit that you will see from other areas in your training yeah. will potentially far outweigh spending 400 quid on a pair of shoes so, every yeah. month or so because you yeah. trash yeah. them because they yeah. don't last. Yeah. And actually a 400 pound pair of shoes isn't going to make you mm. take you from a 40 minute 5k to a 16 minute 5k. It's, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's also putting into perspective actually yeah. Yeah. what that footwear yeah. does and who it does it for as yeah. well yeah. to go actually you will still see big improvements in your pbs you will still see big improvements in your running quality if you adapt mm. the running mm. technique or yeah. the strength or the flexibility and again going back to our our running assessment yeah. we um yes we do video and yes we do have a look at your actual running gait in terms yeah. of yeah. Your, yeah. Your, your running style but underpinning that is are you strong enough and are you flexible enough to get into the positions that right. perfect technique looks like? Um, yeah. Again, perfect technique, I'd, that might be an argument for another day in terms yeah. of what is perfect technique right. um, because that is very dependent on, on the person. Right. But I think conditioning and capacity to load your body repetitively over and over again yeah. as you do in running yeah. i think outweighs potentially some of the technique and the kit and the the other areas that we, yeah. we're, yeah. we're talking about there yeah. and that boils down certainly to strength i would say so you said that on the cadence side we just mm. take it with a bit of a pinch yeah. and salt yeah. sort of thing certainly so, not take the 180 beats a minute with a bit of a pinch of salt because yeah. Yeah. depending on your your kind of body type and body shape you you may find that actually you fall off the other end of mm. 180 beats a minute just being way too fast in yes. terms of leg turn yeah. Yeah, i've tried it just <laughs> like that man <laughs> yeah yeah and it might be that if we looked at, at you yeah, for instance yeah. brian it might be that we go okay look if this guy's potentially got a natural comfy cadence of 140 beats a minute yeah, yeah. then a 40 beat a minute difference is just yeah. totally yeah. I mean, average 160 yeah, yeah. so which so, i think most yeah is yeah. It's pretty good, yeah. And that's where some of the kind of, some of the follow-up research around the 180 beats a minute then started to look at, okay, if we are using cadence to make adaptations to running mm. gait, mm. can we see at what point that happens? And so it might be that for you, if you're running around that 160 beats a minute, mm. there was a couple of studies, I should have should have dug them out, but there was a couple of studies looking at uh, six, eight, ten, twelve percent cadence increases relative to your natural running pace. So right. it might be that if you're at 160 beats a minute and you dial your cadence up to 168, 170, 172, that is more than enough of a change. Right. Rather Would than you, chasing 180 beats a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Would you do that as part of a kind of like an interval, like 400? 400 with the increased cadence and then and then and then a 400 rest exactly then, yeah so it may be that again that partly depends on what your strength and what your muscle capacity is like because typically if you are more of a heel striker and you automatically then start to change your cadence and run more on your forefoot we know that will load your calves more you will be more fatigued through your calves right. so i like to flip that on its head and go do you have calf capacity to allow that change to happen uh, i see or, oh i see where you can, so do yeah, we need to do yeah. a potentially a little bit of kind of benchmark strength yeah. testing and and, yeah. and strength exercising yeah. Yeah. to get us ready for those changes because otherwise it gets pretty miserable if after every run yeah, your calves yeah. feel too lead weights and you're <laughs> hovering yeah. around for a, yeah. for a day or so, so yeah so if we if we're saying like you said if you were looking to do that increase the cadence but basically we would have to do some form of conditioning potentially to yeah. for you to get there so to get, you know yeah. because otherwise I know, I'm going to come back to you the following week and I'll say, Aaron, I've tried to do 170, mm. but I feel, I just yeah. can't. I, yeah, I just yeah. can't do it. Sort mm. of thing. But yeah. would you say, would you advise someone, say, when you, you don't heel strike or do you go maybe on the front foot and try to, that, that kind of thing, or would you maybe, sorry to interrupt, mm, but no. would you watch them on the treadmill and they say, well, just change this, mm. and, and that's what it should feel like? Because I always think it's very much... 
that you, feel. You're spot on there. <laughs> yeah, right. in, in that, actually, that again is something else over the years. When you start to look at chi running, pose running, barefoot running, all of these yeah. different ways yeah. of actually yeah. skinning the same cat, basically, of going, yeah. well, look, yeah. we're trying yeah. to get as fast as we can from A to B. Mm. So, when you look and you compare some of the some of the the theories and some of the kind of technique tips that all of those different types of training and and types of theories um, yeah. suggest, they are very similar. They're just different ways of cueing the same change or yeah. the the, yeah. the the similar technique change. And I think sometimes when you start to almost when you start to do too much reading or start to start to change too too much in one go there's only mm. so much your brain mm. is going to allow you to do mm. and we are talking about movements that are happening in fractions of a second as well so yeah, yeah. how realistic is it for you to be able to change that by going oh yeah i need my yeah, uh, my forefoot yeah, to land yeah, yeah. three millimeters further yeah. forward than yeah, i am yeah, currently yeah. it's just completely unrealistic what we look to do is drive that change by putting you into positions that yeah. you can't do anything but that change, if that oh, makes sense. Oh, interesting. Okay. And so that's where sometimes, when you mention about doing kind of intervals to bring, the, to bring the cadence up, I'd be looking at can we get, if we were using cadence as a cue, can we get cadence reliable mm. regardless of what speed you are going? Yeah, because it needs to be... Not, you're not thinking about it. No, you know, exactly. So, yeah, so it might be that we do have an external cue of yeah. a metronome be, be going along right, at a right, particular cadence, right. and I am thinking about can I hit my foot on the floor yeah, to the time yeah, of that beat? Yeah. The big thing with it is particularly if you're training outside, yeah. speed will increase cadence. Of course, yes. As a yeah. rough rule. Yeah. So typically what you will find is the first mistake people make when they're trying to adapt their cadence is that they just run faster everywhere and then they get out of puff everywhere and then they think, right. oh God, cadence change isn't for me because yeah. I can't hold it. Right. And actually it's almost about saying that's not going to bring about necessarily the technique change that we're after. Okay. And okay. do we have I, I to get. set the speed at a constant Interesting. and then increase the cadence to make that adaptation happen? Yeah. And so yeah. that's where sometimes, yeah. not not saying all the, all the time, but sometimes some treadmill work or some, yes. some set work because where you're you going are at a set constantly, yeah. exactly yeah. you're constantly aware of the speed that you are going and then in effect you start to increase the cadence for the same speed you're going to have to change that yeah. that running right. stride to to make the difference right? yeah so there's all of these things that we have to yeah. consider <laughs> okay so we looked at and that was really quite informative quite a lot is there anything in the upper body that <laughs> people could improve upon or is it your elbows connected to your arm and it all connects together sort of thing but if i noticed though in that little video which is on the website yeah. you know it was showing that the uh, the, the lady was going, you know from side to side her arms going side yeah, to side that yeah. kind of thing so is there anything in terms of the technique from your upper body that or that people could improve upon yeah absolutely yeah. and so again what we've got to have a look at is why that's happening in the yeah. first place so when you're running typically mm. if you're mm. driving with one leg yeah. you're swinging with the opposite leg your, opposite your drive yeah, yeah, yeah. basically yeah. comes from opposite arm and opposite leg yeah. and so to get that drive from opposite arm and opposite leg it has to transition through something in the middle. <laughs> right. Uh, your abs, your obliques, yeah, yeah. your glutes, yeah. your back muscles, your lats. Yeah. So it's one of those areas of going, if I see a, a cross-body swing or a lot of rotation going on through yeah. someone's upper body, yeah. I'm always asking the question of, is that counteracting something that's not happening elsewhere? So again, if we've got a lot of potentially rotational instability through the hips and the pelvis, it might be yeah. that I have yeah. to swing my arm in a certain position right. to try and keep tension and keep, keep me on the straight and narrow, really. So again, it may be as simple as technique change of don't swing your arms like that, swing them like this. Yeah. But it could also be, okay, if we then test your abdominal strength and your glute strength yeah. and your yeah. pelvic strength actually 
we need to bump that up a bit and yeah. then technique starts to sort itself out because right. you don't need to yeah. compensate for what's letting you down elsewhere. Yeah. And I know I've swung it around to strength again, yeah. Um, yeah. but but it's yeah. one of those areas. Because in a way, be, what you're saying is that because of the way you're running, there are your body is giving signals as to why why it is running the way it is and, it, and that for instance the arm swinging mm. whatever mm. or even or even your stride length and that kind of thing yeah. but it may be like you said there may be other factors at play exactly and it's one of those areas that again i would say in the vast majority of the people that we see through the clinic they all run because they love running they don't mm. like the gym necessarily yeah. don't like pushing weights don't like mm. yeah anything else actually yeah, i run yeah. because i like running yeah. and then what we've got to have a look at from a potentially from a performance or from a or from an injury risk perspective is mm -hmm. can we cross train can we add a bit of strength in somewhere to make sure that actually movement efficiency is there to allow us to push our bodies yeah. to the levels that mm. we want to push them to mm. and so that's where things like your couch to 5k is a great way of gradual gentle exposure right. to running stresses yeah typically everyone gets a bit bored and a bit impatient midway through a couch to 5k and goes oh if i can run 3k yeah. i'm sure 5k is okay yeah. and it goes back to that exposure to stresses thing again of mm. if we don't have the underpinning strength and the underpinning stability to yeah. to cope with that yeah then we just potentially increase yeah. our injury risk right and so there's some some strength work and some strength assessments that we can do that gives us a rough idea as to what your output's going to be and whether you're going to be able to cope with yeah. the kind of the level of running or the speed of running or the intensity of training that you're, you're looking so to put your body through. could you, when you maybe prescribe the mm. strength work, do you, yeah. do you know that, okay, if you can do this in terms of your strength work, then... Let's have a look yes. how you're running again. Exactly. And reassess and that kind of thing. Exactly. And hey, presto, you... Here we go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. You, you, and it is so, like yeah. that, yeah. It's hey, presto, so okay, it's, look, it's, if you're you know, struggling to make that technique change, yeah. why are you struggling to make that technique change? Yeah. Or if, you're, yeah. if, if you blow up after... 10 miles of a half marathon why mm. can't you why can't you do that last three miles is it just an endurance thing or is it a mm. power mm. thing or mm. is it a kind of max strength thing or are you just going off too fast mm. so there's all of these different reasons as to why you're potentially missing yeah. the the goals that you're aiming for yeah. and then yeah we boil it down and go well here's the yeah. the factor that we're going to change yeah. and yeah most so, of the time yeah. presto here we go yeah. You've got a good half marathon or you've yeah. got a good 10K. Yeah, I could talk to you for ages. But <laughs> I do have really one one burning question mm. is that if you were doing, let's say, you assess you you prescribed in the strength work, is mm. it better to do strength endurance or like low reps mm. strength? All that is it? Yeah. <laughs> you're looking at it and like, I'm much. Yeah, I'm thinking best answer. So let's say, for that. instance, I, I have a gym membership. Yeah. And he said, well, great, Brian. Okay, we know that you need to improve strength in these areas. Mm -hmm. And you go on either whatever machines or free weights, mm. whatever. What, what are you looking at? Are you Typically, it will be... It will depend on the stage of yeah. training and, and where you are in your training program. Mm. So what we've got to think about when it comes to, to strength typically is it's, it's like a pyramid. So your neuromuscular and your coordination and your balance and all of that sort of stuff yeah. will underpin, will, will be bottom level of, of, yeah. of the pyramid. It's the yeah. widest portion. That's your base. Right. So the more coordinated, balanced controlled you are the more you can then add strength endurance on and so that is as you mentioned low weight high rep repetitive yeah. over and over and over yeah then we've got our kind of hypertrophy phase which is uh, to do with actually muscle bulk and muscle yes. size yeah so if you can imagine we'll go through to the peak yeah. first and then come back down yeah once we've got our hypertrophy and we've got our muscle size then it's about max strength it's about 
okay, I've got a muscle. Yeah. What can I train its output to uh, yeah. to get up to? Yeah. And so that's where we start to lean towards those kind of lower reps, higher higher weights, yeah. and that side of things. And then the kind of the peak, the point of the of the pyramid, typically is power. And so that's where we're looking okay. at in effect the two below plus speed so it's actually yeah, yeah. can i put down max output at pace right. and so that's what creates power basically right. right so if we flip it the other way around can i be powerful if i haven't got absolute max strength if i'm not getting everything out of a muscle that i can mm. i'm never going to necessarily reach that peak or that peak isn't going to be as high as it potentially could be mm. I can't get max strength if I don't have muscle size necessarily. And that doesn't mean that everyone needs to be bodybuilding. This is more about a power to weight ratio more than anything else. Because even when you look at the the sort of, in inverted commas, skinny marathon runners and skinny endurance runners, the power output relative to their kilo of body weight is gigantic. So then we go back down to, I can't really be strong unless I've got muscle size. Yeah. But muscle size can't build consistently if I don't have the endurance to stress it repetitively to make it stronger. So we come back down the pyramid of going early doors in your training program. It might be that we do a lot of light weight, repetitive yeah. and and yeah. high rep movements. Yeah. But as we start to, to to build that up, we've got to look to potentially increasing max strength and increasing okay. power okay. to then get that real output and real hit the ground with purpose yeah. to propel ourselves forwards. Okay. So it may be that you you start off doing that kind of exactly kind of yeah. juice and then you assess it and, and then maybe bring it Exactly, yeah. And so that's where it gets quite interesting when you do start to drop mm. strength training into a runner's a runner's yeah. program because yeah. they will be spending so much of their time mm. slogging themselves to death, probably up and down the towpath behind yeah. us, yeah. looking at their time going, I need to work hard, I need to work hard, I, I need to hit these time intervals. And actually, if they just had more strength, yeah, they'd hit those intervals I mean, without really. I um, I know I interviewed Stuart Hayes, and Ooh. one of the things that he said, because I know he started when I knew him twenty odd years ago, he wished he had a much more bespoke strength coach. Yeah, in yeah. in his early as a junior triathlete, sort mm. of thing, mm. and he would have he felt he would have completely been performed better, Perform sort better. of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah sort of thing. And but I don't know whether it was. Because triathlon was a new sport then, and I don't know. So, yeah, know I think I mean? there's, I think there's a lot of that. I think yeah. it's, I think the nice thing is that in this day and age, there is so much more mm. money in research. There's so much more money in sport. There's so yeah. much more data. There is so much. Yeah, there's so much availability or right. long term data now to go okay look this is what we did 20 years ago how does it compare to what we did 10 years ago what are the athletes like five years ago so it's not to me any real surprise that as that gets more detail Mm. particularly at elite level it's not necessarily a surprise that these kind of records are falling because everything now is dealt with to the nth degree there is no stone that goes unturned with these elite athletes and i think it's one of those areas that that then when it filters down to a a fairly average runner like me we can sometimes get bogged down in almost trying to be too detailed with the programming and think about too many of these very fine very fine restrictions in terms of what i should and shouldn't be doing when actually if i like I say, generally get stronger and I'm in the right kind of ballpark in terms of my technique, then I'll actually see PBs improving quite well. There's a a guy I work with, stands out, this is going back probably a good eight, ten years, and I know this is anecdotal data, but N equals one is always going to show a difference. But but he was a mid-50s runner, still a very good runner. He was a a 306 marathon runner. He he came to me having basically missed sub three a number of times in his marathon, in his marathon kind of journey, and said, look, next year I've got the comrades run, so the, the ultra in, in South Africa. That's 
A race. My B race is is Silverstone um, yeah. half, and he was doing a marathon. I think yeah. it was Ber- it was either Berlin or I can't remember what marathon it was. What's going to make me? I, I don't want to get injured. Yeah. Okay. And I want to be quicker. Yeah. What's What's going to do it for me? And again, it was one of those prime examples where you look at it and actually his training program was in the right realms and his yeah. effort was absolutely in the right realms and his motivation was good and his yeah. hydration and his nutrition were, 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 were good. Yeah. And he didn't do any strength work, any flexibility, any oh, right. real kind of yeah. outside of running. Yeah. Um, he didn't do much else. And all we did was we tweaked his run program and we said okay look rather than putting the extra tempo run in because i don't want to run you into the ground yeah. we'll take one of those tempo sessions out and we'll replace it with a gym session yeah. and that year he went from a 306 yeah. marathon and scrambling around for five seconds 10 seconds 12 second pbs here and there and he dropped his time to a 248 from no. the six marathon wow yeah. and that was in yeah Realistically, uh, it was about six to six to nine months of solid strength training on top of yeah. was doing training wise. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. literally took yeah. eighteen minutes off his, his marathon from just training differently and training what he needed rather than what he what he thought he needed. Yeah, um, I can't believe we nearly done that now because I could just talk to you for ages. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, just I was going to ask you, do you, you because there's so much for the layperson mm. information out there in terms of smartwatches, gadgets, mm. a lot of uh, a lot of resources mm. out there. Do you think there's too much, or is it? Do we get paralysis by analysis type of thing yeah, I, with the with the Strava and they're all great and whatever mm. and I'm just as guilty as anyone uh, are doing yeah. it. but I'd just like to know what your what your view of it is in terms of I I think all technology is great technology I yeah. think it, yeah. It, yeah. It, it has brought the elite level analysis to yeah. to everyone now basically yeah. but you make a good point I think there is a massive portion of that is yeah paralysis by analysis it, yeah. it is that case of there is now so much information that a lot of people worry about what they should and shouldn't be doing more mm. than they ever used to mm. and so there is an element where i think certainly even in even in my career there was that case of going of potentially over complicating certain situations mm. Mm. and then when you step back mm. And you whittle it down to what it actually is. It's mm-hmm. relatively simple to 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 change things. Certainly in certainly in the avid runner, it is useful to use Strava or watches or whatever just to keep an eye on. Actually, have I got any big blips in training? Was last week I ran fifteen miles, and this week I've run twenty five miles, and yeah. then you look back yeah. at it and go, "Oh God, actually." I've put a 40% increase on my miles without even really thinking about it. Yeah. And going back to that kind of load management uh, yeah. point yeah. that I made, yeah. they, it can be quite useful to just keep a running sort of tally on on what stage of your training you're at and, and whether you're seeing any of these big spikes and these big peaks and troughs in your training because that's where injury risk starts to, to really increase. I would say the... Sometimes the drawback of looking at that stuff in too much detail day on day is that then you expect a PB every run and that realistically yeah. just isn't going to happen. And also the other thing is because I know lockdown or, or, or whatever, you know, maybe I was doing, I don't know, 620, 615 a kilometre mm. speed and I'm still doing that sort of thing. Mm. Although I don't, I was probably doing more mileage then and I was feeling fitter then, mm. only because I was doing more. Right. Whereas now I can't do it because it's life in general, mm. work and, and whatever sort of thing. Mm. Like you said, it's not, there's going to be this kind of increase and you're getting yeah. get faster, whatever. Yeah. Because A, you're not an athlete, athlete and B, you think other things get in the way. Mm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think it's been being positive around that of going, actually, yeah, things get in the way and that's yeah. fine. Don't, 
beat yourself up about it. But yeah. also yeah. it's one of those things of going, yeah, if you were comfortably running 615, 620 six months ago, a year ago, and you've not trained consistently since, yeah. then I can't imagine going out and running a 605 tomorrow yeah, is necessarily exactly. going to be A, yeah. realistic, or B, sustainable in the long term because it's that that notch up. But there's a way of doing it. There's a way yeah. of going about that. And then yes. it's, really, it's really about seeing what, in terms of your training, what fits life, what yeah. is realistic in terms of training. Because we could all go, yeah, I've got enough time to train seven days a week. And then you go, mm, actually... I don't. <laughs> we put a seven day a week program together and then go, oh, actually, I'm only getting two or three of those sessions done. Yeah. Whereas if we're upfront at the start and we go, look, I've got two or three sessions a week to, to sort yeah. this, yeah. then it means we just tailor that training to get as best as we possibly can out of those two or three sessions a week. Yeah. And it will still get you results. It will still yeah. get you progress. Yeah. Like someone said, it's not about destination, it's about the journey. <laughs> <laughs> My last question, and you've been brilliant. Thank you very much no, no, uh, for coming. So. Do you have any sporting, I don't know, uh, do you admire anyone within the sporting realm sort of thing? Or is there Ooh, anyone? It's putting me on the spot, isn't it? Um, anyone in the sporting realm? Um, in the past or in now? The past. There are, yeah, I would say that there's a lot of names that that, yeah. that come out there. I think you've got, I've treated some of them. There was a lady, I, I would say certainly from a, from a sort of, success point of view there's i won't name her but she'll no, no. know who she is but there was a lady who came to me with a with an on-off history with grade three four cartilage wearing both knees she oh, was right. a, a a very good yeah. hike yeah hiking mountaineer ultra runner okay. but was breaking down every other week or every right, other month right and actually she again took it on herself to to change her ways and change her mm, training mm, and mm. do whatever she she yeah. needed to do to get that sorted and i think again with her it was just that drive to yeah to continue it was impressive yeah, yeah. and, and yet she then ended up going from being told is ultra running a good idea on those knees to to you know winning the spine race winning oh, the right. arc of attrition these are yeah. big multi-day long events and actually getting to a position where she could do it and that was right. all about perseverance consistency doing what she needed to do yeah. loading herself and keeping eyes on the prize basically yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah i would say there's i'm lucky enough to work with all of these people day in yeah. day out and actually whether that be someone who's managed their first 5k for their yeah uh, in their life or up to, to to those kind of levels yeah there's always inspiring stories, stories and inspiring yeah. people around it really yeah Okay. As I said, I could have talked to you for ages, but is there anything you'd like to promote? I don't know if you're on social media or I know you've got the website, which is move. Movephysio.co.uk. Move yeah, yeah. yeah. So I would say if there's anything, if any of it's resonated with, with you in particular, yeah. come and see us, Brian. But, but yeah, certainly I would say if you need any more information, we're always at the end of an email, uh, or yeah. always at the end of a call. So yeah. even if it's that case of you're not really sure what's, you need or when you yeah. need it or what yeah. might be an option let us know movephysio.co.uk or info at movephysio.co.uk yeah. um have and a there's look a form at kind of i think you can do. fill yeah, in yeah exactly. exactly yeah there's a contact form there yeah i would say don't don't suffer in silence there is always a way yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. finding what that and like is. you said like we said right at the beginning in terms of it is a holistic thing exactly. it's mental health which is especially and if you can patch someone up mm. then you're doing a hell of a lot for mm. them but okay thank you very much it's Sharon for coming no thanks for having me that's it for another episode and looking forward to speaking to you next week with some beginner hints and tips about running I just want to let you know that you can follow me on x or what was known as twitter at Brian's Rompod I have just recently set up a facebook page which is called Brian's Rompod and I am on instagram at Brian's Rompod also, my website is www.brianesrompod.co.uk where you can get show notes or on whatever podcasting app you are listening to the show. Plus, all my episodes have chapter markers if you need to get to different segments of the show. Plus, leave a review 
as it will help others find this podcast. Music is Happy Day by Stock Audio, not forgetting artwork by Alice Patterson. Till next week, thanks again for listening. 